Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. It's a story of survival and faith. Umar Melinde has survived 12 attempts on his life, the last of which drastically altered his physical appearance and nearly killed him. Arlston Kempker with Melinde's story and why he knows God has his back. Now we warn you, some of the images that you're about to see are graphic. God. Umar Melinda grew up a Muslim in Uganda, like so many of his fellow countrymen. After some time of being a Muslim, I never expected to be a Christian. Uh, but one day I had a preacher who was preaching using the Bible and using the Muslim Quran. I listened to him and I realized that uh, my heart is telling me Christianity is the truth I have to change. While his heart was telling him Christianity, converting is another story. Melinda says those who turn away from Islam face persecution. One night, after fearing being persecuted, I was sleeping. And uh, in the night, I got a dream when my hands and my legs are on chains and I was in the midst of fire. I was crying. I saw even some other people whom I normally go with in a mosque. And uh, we were crying, Allah Akbar, Jalla Jalla Allah. And the hands are on the chains, and the uh, legs are chains, tied, you know. But in the midst of this horrible thing of fire, you know, like when you are in a swimming pool, but this swimming pool was a, a different one. It's a, a pool of fire, and I was crying. But now, in the midst of crying, somebody stood outside the fire and told me that. Uh, Islam is leading you to this torture. Repent. Become a Christian. You shall survive. So that's what he did. In the morning, it was a resurrection Sunday. I took myself to the church and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It's a decision that's tested him and has nearly cost him his life. 24th of December 2011, uh, as I was coming out of my church, the people came and I was going to enter the vehicle and they poured the acid and they shouted Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, which means God is great. Melinda was rushed to a hospital in Uganda that was ill-equipped to handle the burns he experienced. He was transferred to a hospital in India and then to one in Israel that specialized in burn treatment. All the skin from here up to here, it had to be removed because it was burnt severely. I got a deep wound from here up to here. The skin could go down, and this one was going up. You could see whatever is inside. I, I couldn't do this. If I tried, the head could have gone off. So the skin was removed, and I got a skin implant on my face and transplant. So Melinda's story is one that's all too common among Christians around the world. According to Open Doors, 772 acts of violence are committed against Christians each month with more than 300 Christians being killed for their faith, with the majority being in the Middle East. I represent uh, many people who are persecuted because of their religious affiliation and their religious faith. Despite his trials and the persecution he's faced, his faith has never wavered. In fact, it's only become stronger. He said that there is a time, there will be a time, when people will try to kill you, meaning his followers, and he said, when they kill you, they will think that they are serving God. So we have people today who are killing Christians and uh, thinking that they are serving God. So because of that knowledge and uh, that uh, uh, understanding, even though it's painful, I, have, I don't doubt what I believe. He now travels the U.S. and the world sharing his testimony and message that we must all live together in peace. As Christians, uh, we respect Muslims and Muslims have to respect Christians and leave each other, uh, you know, in peaceful because we are human beings and God is hidden somewhere. So let God judge his people, but let us live as uh, citizens and friends and neighbors. Help me welcome Pastor Umar. Come on up. Pastor Umar, have a seat. You know, today is, is a very, very special and unique day. You can be seated. Thank you. Um, 
You know, spending time with Pastor Umar yesterday, all day yesterday, was, uh, was, was a breath of fresh air. Um, you know, today, today the church has, has, uh, of America, of America has, uh, has really uh, been watered down. And, uh, and very silent, very quiet. And uh, the message that he's bringing to the United States of America is, where is the church? Because uh, the church is suffering. Every three minutes, somewhere in the globe, a Christian is being martyred. Every three minutes. Because they refuse to deny their faith. They refuse to reject and deny Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And uh, when you look at uh, Pastor Umar's story, um, this is a man who was born into a, a family of Islamic um, radicalists. And, and these were not just uh, family members that were Muslims. These were leaders in the uh, Muslim movement. And so he became very well educated abroad, the Middle East, in uh, this, this radicalist mindset. And, uh, and I love his story, and I, and I keep hearing this from a lot of Muslim people that I speak to that are now born-again believers, Christians, that Jesus, and I, and I hear it, it's like a theme with Muslims, where they have this encounter with Jesus. And, and sometimes I ask myself, man, that sucks that Jesus has to still leave his throne room to come and talk to Muslims because Christians won't rise up and talk to them. And, uh, and it's shocking and it's, it's hurtful, but I believe that the reason that the church doesn't step forward is because uh, the scripture says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The average Christian does not know how to share what they believe. They don't know what they believe, why they believe it. Uh, they can give you maybe just, you know, random information, but there's really no intentional understanding of, of our faith in Christ Jesus. And I don't think, I honestly don't think that the church is necessarily fully responsible. I think the church has a part in that. But every single believer, every single one of you have a responsibility to know your Jesus, to know the word of God, to have a rhema revelation where you begin to understand how you fit in this amazing kingdom of God and how you can penetrate your workplace, how you can penetrate your, your community with the love of Jesus Christ, but also be able to uh, intelligibly uh, express what you believe and why you believe it. And uh, yesterday we were in Hollywood, and uh, it was Holly, Holly weird yesterday. Uh, it, there, I'm not, there were so many activists out there uh, there was uh, people uh, that were, you know, wanting Trump impeached, and there were people there that had uh, uh, the same Bible, only they were using it uh, in a deceptive way, saying that the white man is is evil. Kill the white man, and and this is these are these are like messages that are being preached on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, riot police were out in Hollywood, and, and all kinds of crazy stuff is just happening. I really felt, I was telling Pastor Rome, I'm like, man, I feel like we're in the apocalypse here, man. It's just, it was crazy, and then people with signs repent for Jesus, and, it, and it's just like kind of, you know, at first I'm like, man, how are you going to win anybody like that? But I, I, I came to that conviction, I'm like, you know what, well, it, they're not there to win me, they're there to possibly win someone who may respond to that goofy sign, but at least, I can say this, at least they have boldness and courage to share Jesus. So uh, you have to ask yourself, what, when was the last time I've shared anything about Jesus? So I give them more props for what they're doing, even though sometimes it's done in a very, you know what, uh, non-relatable way to, to reach people, but uh, it's needed. And so Pastor Umar is here with us today, and, and I want you just to just share your heart because... You know what, your story is, uh, is something that, that needs to be heard. And uh, amazingly, after 12 attempts to, to, to kill you in, in, in Uganda, uh, you continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is just so awesome and honorable. And he pastors a church and has an orphanage as well for children. But just talk to us today. I want you to speak to the church today, the church that God is trying to reach in America, the church that has been sleepy. It's a sleepy giant, kind of like, like 9-11. The world looked at America and it said, finally, the sleeping giant has awakened. And so I really believe that it's time for the church to wake up. So just speak to our hearts today, Pastor Omar. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, your wife and uh, all the ministers in this church. Uh, I want also to thank my friends, uh, Dennis and Maria. They have accommodated me in their house and uh, <coughs> they have visited my church in Uganda. 
And I want to greet all of you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm very happy to be here this morning. I'm called Pastor Uma Molinde. I'm the senior pastor of Gospel Life Church International. It's based on Entebbe Road. Entebbe is the main airport, international airport in Uganda. As you go to the airport on your way, that's where our church is on that road. And uh, it's a mission-minded church. But originally, I was not born in a Christian family. I was born in a Muslim family. And uh, I never expected to be a Christian. You know, Islam and Christianity are totally different. Yeah. And uh, I always tell people that uh, Islam and Christianity are at opposite ends, you know, uh, opposite direction. This one is going this way, this one is going this way. Like I was giving an example. Uh, for you to be a Christian, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Do I have somebody this morning who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah. Are you here today? Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, you cannot imagine somebody to be a believer in the Bible and is not believing Jesus to be a Son of God. Actually, to tell you the truth, according to what I know in the Bible, if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you cannot be saved. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So when you don't believe the son of God in the Bible, you are in trouble. But uh, when I was a Muslim, one of the things that you must hate most is any teaching that God has a son. The Quran says that when you say that God has a son, even the heaven gets annoyed and wants to fall on you. Even the mountains, the earth gets annoyed and wants to move away. And the world wants to open up to swallow you because you are saying that God has a son. Uh, that is complicated now because if you reject the Son of God, you cannot see salvation of God. Because according to the Bible, in the book of uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 5, he says, Who overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Clear. And in that same chapter, Verse 10 to 12, it says, God has given us everlasting life, and this life is in his Son. For us who believe the Bible, God decided to give us eternal life, but the life he packed it in his Son. That's why the Bible says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Yeah. So the rejection of Jesus being a Son of God was putting me in a dangerous position. And according to the Bible, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, it says that such a teaching that rejects Jesus to be a son of God is a spirit of antichrist. You read it in your Bible. That the teaching that rejects Jesus to be a son of God is a teaching of antichrist. That's why, Christians, you need to pray for our Muslim brothers that the eyes will be opened. Because uh, the Bible says that if this gospel is being covered, is covered because the eyes of people are covered by darkness. So we need to pray. I was a Muslim. I was rejecting Jesus to be a son of God. And not only that, uh, but in the church, one of the best teaching uh, you teach, uh, or we teach, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. How many people believe that Jesus died for you? Yeah. You believe right. that? Yeah. And actually, there is no uh, hope of remission of sins 
where there is no blood of Jesus. The cross represents a sacrifice. And this is common, basic, important teaching of the church. Uh, and we cannot amend the Bible to reject the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But when I was a Muslim, I was told, it's in the teaching of the Quran, Islamic theology, that I studied Islam, I studied Arabic, I'm a Muslim theologian. I said, that Jesus was not crucified on the cross. Jesus did not die. So with such kind of teaching, I saw as if it was very hard for me to believe in Christ Jesus. But one day, I had the preaching of the gospel. And this preaching, this is a man who was reaching out to Muslims in Uganda. In 1974, in Uganda we had a president, his name was called Idi Amin Dada. He was popular. I don't know if you have ever heard about that name, Idi Amin Dada, the president of Uganda. Have you ever heard about that name? So uh, that man declared Uganda to be an Islamic state. Even though Muslims were the minority, but in 1974, he said Uganda is an Islamic state. He banned uh, some faith like evangelical churches and uh, spiritual churches were banned. Christian preachers were put in prison and uh, some of them were killed publicly by firing squad. They could put pastors there and shoot the bullets. Then after the overthrow of the government of Idi Amin, then this man was praying and he got a, uh, a transformation of God and God told him that reach out to Muslims. So this man began to preach and reaching out to Muslims using the Bible and the Muslim Quran, quoting it. So I heard this man preaching and I was so amazed because at first I could hear people preaching the Bible and I would say, that is not my book. Yeah. But now this man was quoting the Quran <clears throat> And he was quoting only the verses that were in agreement with what he wanted to preach with the Bible. I had the preaching and it was very interesting. And I was, you know, very touched to realize that Jesus Christ is mentioned in the Quran many times yeah. than Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And Jesus is mentioned 93 times in the Quran. And Muhammad is mentioned 24 times. <laughs> So the man was asking, if you have two candidates and it's an election and one candidate gets 24 votes mm -hmm. and another one gets 93 votes, who is the <laughs> elected member of parliament yeah. or elected uh, president? Yeah. Uh, that, uh, then he, he also quoted a number of the things about the miracles of Jesus and about how Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned 97 times and is the only woman who is mentioned by name in the Quran. All women, they could say, a wife of so-and-so, a wife of so-and-so, but this woman, they said Mary, and they gave him the longest chapter of the Quran. It's chapter 19. So it gave me, uh, you know, an a, a opening to listen, and I listened to this man after wonderful preaching, I, I realized that Christianity is the truth and I, I, I felt in my heart that I have to be a Christian. But I feared to change because when you change, the law of Islam says, Man in dinihi If you desert Islam, you have to be killed. Mm -hmm. So I was coming from a staunch Muslim family. Uh, you know, I feared my colleagues, I feared the people I go with in the mosque. And uh, I, but in my heart, I knew for sure Christianity is the truth. Hmm. But in the midst of that kind of fear, when I was sleeping in the night, I got a dream. In this dream, my hands and my legs were on chains, and uh, I was in the midst of fire. It was a terrible dream. Just imagine yourself dreaming that you, you've been tied on chains, 
and you find yourself in the midst of fire. It's like a swimming pool, but it's a pool of fire. Wow. And then I was crying, Allah Akbar, Jalla Jalla. But when I looked behind and forward, I saw that some of the people crying with me are some members of my uh, friends whom we go with in the mosque. We are all crying. And then somebody appeared outside the fire and he told me that Islam is leading you to this torture. Hmm. Repent, become a Christian, you shall survive. I came out of the dream. Uh, it was a terrifying one because even my bed sheets were wet. That means I was sweating in the dream. And uh, I prayed a prayer. You know, in Islam we pray a prayer against bad dreams. And I prayed a prayer against this bad dream. And then when I went back to sleep, the dream came again. And uh, I could not sleep that, that night. In the morning, I went to my grandfather, who is an area imam, and I told him about this. And then he told me that evil spirits are classified into two groups. One, there is a Muslim spirits among the evil spirits. There are those who are Muslims, and there are those who are Christians. Then he said the Christian spirits attack the Muslims. So he told me that we can pray and chase away the Christian spirits that wants to entice me to be a Christian. So we prayed, chasing away the Christian <laughs> spirits. But after that, I went back to sleep and the dream came again. I got a dream over three times. And uh, I remembered that the, pr the preacher said that if you pray anything in the name of Jesus, it can be done. So that time, I did not pray as a Muslim. I knelt down and lifted my hands and I said, God, if you are the one who wants me to be a Christian, take this dream away. If you take it away, I will take myself to the church and be a Christian. After the prayer, I was relaxing on my bed and that night, I slept like a baby. <laughs> the dream did not come back. I just remembered in the morning that, oh, I was fearful of the dream and it did not come back. Guess what? That very morning was a, a, a resurrection Sunday. And the nearby church, they were celebrating about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I took myself to the church and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Wow. Since wow. that day, I am a, a servant and a believer in the Son of God, the one who died and rose from the dead, and the one who sacrificed his life for my sins. Yeah. Give me praise in the <laughs> But something happened. As I was coming out of the church, I was going out. Three of my Muslim friends, they saw me coming out of the church. And uh, they began quarreling with me. How can you go to a church? A son of a staunch Muslim leader. How can you go to a church? And then they argued with me and they went to a mosque where I normally, a mosque is the equivalent of a church. A mosque is a place uh, of Muslim of where you go to, 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 to pray like we come here. So they went to a mosque and told the leader and they told everybody uh, what happened. They all ganged on me. And, uh, you know, when you receive Christ, there is this kind of perception. I don't know whether you got it. I got it myself. When you receive Christ, you think that everybody, if I tell everybody, he will believe. Yeah. So I went to my, to my family, I thinking that, what I feel in my heart, when I tell them, they will believe immediately. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I reached there, I told them, I told my parents, they got sticks, they got loot, <laughs> they got stones, and they wanted to finish me there. Wow. My, my, my elder brothers, they got pangas, you know, swords, and they said, you Umar, you know Islam. Actually, they say that if they cut off my neck, they can go to heaven straight. Hmm. So I ran away for my dear life, hmm. and uh, I went to the church. I was homeless for some time because of Jesus. 
And uh, since that time, I have survived over 12 assassination attempts on my life, including guns, bombs, poison, arson, they burnt me in a house. And uh, recently, uh, around a few years ago, on the 24th of December, 2011, uh, uh, to, to tell you, uh, to, uh, to, to go back a little bit, uh, through the process of persecution, I went to the church, I was discipled, I loved Jesus, and uh, was trained in ministry when the call of, of God was realized on me, and then I began to preach the gospel. Uh, those who chased me, they could see me on TV preaching Jesus Christ. And then uh, later on, I became a pastor of this church. So, after becoming a pastor, in that process, I had survived several attempts, but as I was coming out of my church on the 24th of December 2011, people attacked me outside the church and they poured a bucket of acid on my face. So this face you see, I was not born like this. I was one of the typical beautiful African men. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my face was disfigured and these glasses you see, I'm not trying to swagger. <laughs> no swaggering here. No swag up in this yeah, place. It's, it's a point of uh, you know survival because my eyes and uh, my face was burnt severely. If Jesus was not alive, I couldn't be alive today. Amen. But the reason you see me here talking to you, it's a proof. That there is a God in heaven. Yeah, that's right. That's there right. There is a powerful God. There is a mighty God. They burnt this face with acid. Acid is one of the most burning chemicals in the world. In Africa, we use acid to, you know, to test between metal and gold. And whatever metal you bring and put in acid, it will dissolve. Just imagine, if acid can dissolve a metal, what can happen if it's put on a human skin? They put acid on me, and all my skin was peeling off and falling away. I was taken to best hospitals in Uganda. The situation was worse. They took me to India. I was uh, in best hospitals. And the situation was worse. Acid succeeded to penetrate here. I had a deep wound from here up to here. And this skin was going down and this one was going up. And the nurses tried to clean me. When they touched here, the skin began to peel off and falling away. I saw my skin falling away. And the doctor said, I have 99 chances to die. But I said, if God wants me to die, let me go. But if God wants me to live, I will stick on this 1%. 1% with God is Come better on. than the majority. Come on. Amen. Amen. I stick on 1% and here I am. God is powerful. I'm alive and I can tell a story. Yeah. Miraculously, I went from India and I was taken to Israel. And I've been living in Israel for the last three and a half years, uh, undergoing specialized treatment in the Sheba Hospital in Tel Shomer in Tel Aviv. I've lived in uh, in in uh, uh, in Jerusalem. You know, when I left hospital, I was as an outpatient, staying in Jerusalem and coming to Tel Aviv. Uh, what is my message out of this? One, Christians. You may suffer for the faith, but don't lose hope. Yeah. Number two, uh, we have to understand that Christians are the most persecuted people today. America has confirmed this. United Nations has confirmed this. European Union has confirmed this. But... Apart from confirming 
What is the responsibility of the church? According to the Bible, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, actually even in verse 26, that we believers in Jesus, we are part of the body of Christ. Yeah. That means we are part of one another. You may, maybe you have just seen me today, but I am part of you, and you are part of me. This does not mean staying in one country. Wherever anybody who is a Christian, whatever happens to him, must be a point of your concern. Because if we are part of the body of Christ, that means whatever affects one member of the body will affect us. So according to the Bible, when we, we look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, Simon Peter was persecuted and was put in prison. What did the church do? The Bible says the church stood with Simon Peter. Again, there was a persecution and Paul was about to be killed. The Bible says, and brothers helped Paul to go through the window. And many, many incidents of that kind. And in, when you go into the book of uh, 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 I mean Matthew chapter 25, Jesus was talking about people who took care of his brothers who were suffering. Yeah. So the church today needs to take a strong stand in support of the suffering church around the world. Specifically in America, you have a strong voice. Let your voice be heard. Speak up. Stand in prayer. I said here in the morning, what do we have to do? Number one, let's begin with prayer. Always remember to pray for the people who are persecuted. When you have a chance, support them. When you have an opportunity, which you have, like now you live in a democratic country where there is institutions and law, be a voice. Let there be advocacy. Yeah. Advocate for the people who are suffering. Because Simon Peter, Apostle Peter said, that our enemy, Satan, is like a lion. is going from this place to another, this place to another. If we don't stand and resist persecution there, we will see it here. Yeah. If we don't help our brothers there, we will find ourselves in the same thing. It's possible. I'll give you an example uh, based on my background. Most of the countries that are persecuting uh, Christians are Muslim countries. Do you know that? Yes, I was a Muslim. But do you know that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world today? Yeah. What does that mean? The same people who have burnt Molina with acid The same countries, the same people, the same religious faith, they, they are your friends and your neighbors. But as a church, are we going to hate them? No. no. Are we going to fight them? No. That's why I tell people, I'm not a hate speaker, but I am a speaker of truth. Yeah. Why? Even the people who burnt me with acid, I did not cast them. I don't wish them bad. The first thing I did before they took me to the hospital is to forgive them. Hmm. I said, Lord, forgive them. I have no grudge against the people. My concern is not to hate the people, it's to love the people. And my speech is not against the people, it's against the spirit and ideology. Yeah. And the ideology is dangerous. I was telling people in the morning that 
the ideology of Islamic extremism is a dangerous ideology that does not only affect Christians, but it affects Muslims the more. That's why you find bombs being planted in mosques, in, you know, and you wonder who came with this. Yeah. You know, you said you were a believer. How do you bring a bomb when you come to pray? They bomb Christians and they bomb Muslims as well. So that's where I pray that the Lord will cause us to understand Muslims and Christians and understand how to stand together to, uh, to, to, to fight this danger because it's dangerous to us and it's dangerous to them. Yeah. But the best way to fight this danger is to believe the truth. Unfortunately today, all that is being said on the media by politicians is just a wrong theory, wrong perception, and they are failing to clearly interpret or translate what exactly is the root cause of extremism. Yeah. The root cause of, of extremism is a dangerous, murderous attitude. Like this one, when somebody will say, if you desert Islam, you have to be killed. Why? Why you kill me? Why don't you leave me for God to judge me? That's why Christians, we should not be politically correct. Hmm. We should not spread political correctness. We should spread truth. Spread the gospel. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's right. That's why I told pastor that one of the dangers of our days is for Christians to believe the newspapers, the media, the uh, uh, social media. Yeah, so we, we were talking, Bible. yeah. We, we have that issue where uh, I think we put more faith in the news. Every single day we're watching, we're watching, and, and we believe that more than, 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 than the, the scripture, than the, than the, the truth. That's the danger of our generation. Yeah. We need to know that what drives our lives is the word of God. Yeah. And we need to support the word of God and our churches and men of God and stand together in unity. There is another thing which is dangerous in our generation is the disunity of the Christians. Yeah. Jesus yeah. said, you shall be one. Yeah. Be united that the world will know that you are my disciples. But today, we are more divided. Yeah, we are. We need to be united. Another thing is to, there is a spirit of fear. There is a spirit of fear. When we think about these things, we, we get afraid. And Jesus said, do not fear them. Don't fear those who kill the flesh, but fear him who can kill the flesh and the spirit. So because of the spirit of fear, we get political correctness and we get compromise. But Bible says in the first uh, in the book of Second uh, Timothy chapter one and verse seven that God did not give us the spirit of fear. Yeah. That's why I pray that fear will be out of your heart in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. We need to throw away fear and get boldness. One of the examples that Pastor was talking about is the Hollywood. I went to Hollywood and I said, Wow. Everybody is determined to do evil. Yeah. Everybody is committed to do evil. I looked at a man, you know, I am a preacher of the Bible. I looked at a man who is preaching exactly things out of context. Yeah. But the man is very committed. And, and he was using the Bible. Using the Bible. And uh, to me, he doesn't know even the Bible is using yeah. the Bible to speak what he wants. But he's very committed. Yeah. It's a high time. People of the truth, let us be committed to our faith. That's right. And stand with the truth. Always remember the people who are persecuted because of their faith. I want to add something to what you're saying. Um, and it's beautiful what you shared at the, at the 8 a.m. And, and, and we're going to show some of your pictures. But one of the things that you, that you shared was uh, acid is, is something huge 
that is used against believers in, in, in Africa. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's like the weapon of choice. Exactly. It's a weapon of choice because if it doesn't kill you, it will deform you forever. And uh, to our sisters, this is a horrible thing. Because if there is anything that a woman will need, is a face. Yeah, yeah. They use this one to punish sisters. Yeah. I mean, female. Listen to me very attentively and take this message very seriously. Now, after succeeding in Africa, they have succeeded in India and Pakistan. Go and look at the news. Today, there is dangerous attacks of acid in the city of London. If it reaches London, there is nothing that can hinder it to come to California. That's right. If it reaches London, actually, I, I, uh, they said in one week, there were 33 incidents of acid in London. In one week. So it's happening. This is what the Bible says. The enemy is moving here and there. That's why when we hear the danger there, it's our uh, time to stand. Let us stand as a church. Yeah. Let us consider those things. Yeah. Because if they are killing our brothers and sisters because of Jesus, and that is the Jesus we have, yeah. that means we are in a line, you know, we are on the front line of this danger. Yeah. May and I show you some of Yes, that before I, you, before, as you prepare that, go ahead and prepare your pictures. Yes. I want to share this. Um, the reason I have Pastor Umar here with us today uh, it's not just for you guys to hear a phenomenal testimony because I know many of us can leave here today and be like, wow, man, isn't that great what he's doing? Isn't that great that he's got this crazy, amazing story? No, he, he was graced to be kept alive by, by God to bring a message to the church. There's, there's a reason, there's a purpose why he's here. And, and it's interesting that acid was used um, uh, on you to attack you um, and it's so extreme that even today he has, and of course he won't share this, but I will, um, he has security, armed security soldiers that are with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week because of the threats of his life. He has seven children and does not live with any of his children. They, all his children are separated in different homes because of the threat on their life as well. This is a life that he has chosen to live to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just to Africa, but now the United States of America. And it's, it's, it's beautiful, but it's, I think it's, it's like bittersweet too. The bitter part of this is that where is the church of America? America used to be the church that would send missionaries all over the world and bring revival and bring change. Today, the church of America is watered down. It's quiet. She's silent. You know what? The church is to be magnificent. The church is to be penetra penetrated. The church is supposed to have the voice, but we've been so quiet and so comfortable in our pews and so comfortable with, with, with just trying to, you know what, uh, capture the American dream of having the career, the house, that nothing wrong with those things, but, but where's the church today? Look at, look at what uh, 1 Peter 1.7 says. It says, pure gold, pure gold put in fire comes out of it, proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering, everybody say suffering, suffering. comes out proved genuine. Listen, the thing that they use in Africa to test gold is acid. Your test has proved his genuine faith. That though he's been suffering for many years and continues to suffer, but like Paul said, when he was fasting and praying, when he, ha he was left in the ocean, when he was beat, when he was in prisons, you know, you would think that would be enough for Paul to say, you know what, man, I want to get out of this thing. This is way too much. But he said, the thing that concerns me daily and Spending time with you, Pastor Umar, and our conversation yesterday was the same conversation we had. The thing that concerns him and that concerns Paul, that concerns us, is the church. Where is the church? Where is the church? Where are you? Where are you? He said something to me very profound yesterday. He said, he said I am the voice to bring a face to those that have no voice. And he goes on to say, when Jesus wraps this all up, 
It's your faith. Everybody say, it's your faith. It's not your gold that God will have on display as evidence of his victory. When you stand up, it shows that there is evidence that there is a God in heaven who is real. When you know your faith, when you understand how to explain your faith, when you know how to explain the scriptures like that pastor did with you, you have umars that come into play. And you may not have a platform like Umar, but you can have a platform in your workplace. You can have a platform in your business. You can have a platform in your house where you're raising your children to not be, listen, it, and I know we use this term a lot, be radical, be rival, but how about just be faithful to Jesus? And so I, I want us to leave here today to say, where's my faith? Where are you, Mauricio? Where are you, Devin? Where are you, Anusha? Where's the people of God? And and that's what Pastor Umar's here. He's waking up the church. Uh, show, Show those images, Pastor. Go ahead. There you go. Your microphone. Uh, explanations this is a scripture we need to understand the seasons and times in the time where we are people believe lies than truth we live in a moment where people call good bad and bad good so we need to promote truth according to the word of God Uh, when you see the challenge of uh, changing this world into an Islamic empire is growing and that means the danger we are talking about will soon come to your cities if we don't stand up. Like now you see in UK they were saying Sharia is the future of UK and some people they have uh, some untrue theories they say that the cause of extremism is Islamophobia to tell you the truth that is not the cause the cause is there is a tendency of establishing an Islamic empire where everybody will be Muslim and where every, every non-Muslim will be killed that is the target of extremists so that's why somebody was telling me I was in UK and somebody said you know political imbalance because Christians are the leaders and they don't give opportunity to Muslims that's the reason there is radicalism. I said, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Today, if political imbalance was the cause of extremism, look at the United Kingdom. Who is the mayor of London? He's a Muslim. But how many terrorist activities that has been going on in the last two months only? Very many. That means not political imbalance. Yeah. The challenge is there is a radical theory, theory or ideology that is going on and the world is just trying not to believe but that is the truth. Yeah. And uh, you see in the cities in Europe you will find people demonstrating and saying Islam will dominate. Nobody has ever said Christian will dominate. Yeah. We don't need Christian to dominate and we don't force Christianity on everybody. So these, these are just signs for us to understand that danger is ahead of us. And uh, here they say 9-11, beginning of the end of democracy. Because they cannot establish an empire where there is a democratic system. Yeah. So they want to kill a democracy and establish the empire. And uh, this one is actually in America. But he said, if we are practicing Muslims, we are above the law of the land. That means he is ready to defy the constitution of, of America and establish whatever he wants. And these are the dangers that we, we, we have to understand. I told you I was a beautiful guy. <laughs> you remember that? Look at that face. You know? So uh, after that face, I was uh, presenting a petition in the parliament of Uganda, they wanted to establish Sharia. Why we have to stop it? Because when Sharia is in rule, Christians are killed and murdered. Where there is Sharia rule, 
there is murder, a persecution of Christians and burning of churches. We want democracy or a free ways that freedom of speech will be uh, going on and freedom of... And expression. when you stop that Sharia, that's when the acid happened. Exactly. That was in, uh, in, in, in April 2011 and then they declared a fatwa on me and uh, from there, look at what happened. And then after that, when you look down under my cheek, you can see that the neck was almost being cut off. You can see that? I, I, could, I couldn't do this. If I tried, the head could have gone off. After there, all the skin you see, this dark area on my right side, you see that all dark area? That skin had to be removed. That All of it, they removed it and threw it away. Wow. And uh, that's the night I will never forget. The doctor told me I have 99 chances to die. I slept like that, in that kind of uh, gesture, for almost eight months. And uh, from there, you can see, when you look at that, you can say, oh my. But to me, when I looked at that, I said, at least, because that was a surgery. Actually, that was after four surgeries on my face. Just imagine, how was it at the first surgery? Wow. Then, some of them are worse. I was given wheelchairs and uh, I was learning how to walk. I own oxygen and uh, many, many others. After there, I went back to Uganda because I have, I have a church and I have other people. I'm not alone. I have other people. I had to help them. And uh, some of them are women like uh, you can see this one. They burnt her with acid. They burnt all the breasts. Just imagine a woman, if breasts are burnt, what can happen? What kind of pain of, is that? But besides that, that is not the bad side of it. The bad side of it, the most bad side of it, is they burnt her when she was holding a baby. And here is the baby, and the baby was burnt, and burnt severely. And, and, and also, listen, that woman was thrown acid on because she would refuse to deny Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, that's faith. That, that you would be willing to sacrifice not only your life, but even her child. And in her mindset, there was no way in hell, literally, that she would deny Jesus Christ. We don't know persecution, church. Our persecution is someone flipping us off. Our persecution is you sharing your faith and they tell you, shut up, I don't want to hear you. That's, that's, that's our persecution. Their persecution is, you know what, renounce Jesus or your head will be cut off. Renounce Jesus or we're going to kill your family. And it's amazing how uh, these amazing believers that truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ refuse in the midst of danger to deny him and to keep preaching the gospel of Jesus. This is not just a guest speaker. This is someone who has allowed the word to govern your life, to govern your decisions. And uh, Pastor Umar, we're, we're, we're just so blessed the fact that you continue to, to do what you do, though you're still being threatened at this very hour as we speak. And, uh, and the grace of God is all over you. What would you say to the church as, as we close now? What would you say to the church? What would you want to say to us, the church? Because I really believe that all of us here need to walk away with, with something, with a commission, um, a command. Like Paul, he would show up to the churches and he would, he would warn them, but he would always, always commission them to do something greater. Let us be united for a right cause. And let us not fear. Let us not be driven by political correctness and compromise. Let us know God, Jesus Christ, came to save us and to send us to spread the truth of the gospel. Yeah. Let us be committed to the Great Commission. But always remember, a church is not only us people sitting here. It's the body of Christ all over the world. Yeah. When we are happy, we should be happy. But let us remember those who are persecuted and they are connected to us and they are born of Christ in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Africa, in China, 
and all over the world. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.